These were films that the state commissioned. These were films that every cinema hall was forced to exhibit as part of their mandate to exhibit popular cinema as well. They were called the film division reels. Of course, the audiences never liked them. The men were out smoking or having chai. The women were chit-chatting. The kids were just bored out of their minds. <laughs> but the other sort of thing, so the audiences were, of course, disconnected. The subjects were mostly uh, presented as ethnographic novelties. This was about mapping the cookies and the mesos and mapping and producing the nation space, so to speak. And that's where really it takes off. A large number of filmmakers emerge from that tradition. The I suppose the phrase that captures it best is sort of a Bharatic Khoj, the discovery of India sort of tradition that was happening at that time. Um, but it captures very well the shifts in the relationship between, let's say, filmmakers, audiences, and the subject of the documentaries themselves, where the 70s really marks a crucial turn. And post-emergency, with a very, very strong left politics emerging, this is when documentary becomes critical and starts mapping the many abuses and failures of the state. But it's a very masculinist, masculinist critique. These are the you know, names like Anand Patwardhan, Tapan Bose, Utpalendu Chakravarti. These are the kinds of people who are making these films. And it, it's very, it comes across very clearly in the form of these films as well. I mean, unlike this, some of the films from that era would have minutes together, mid-shots mid -shot, mid of interviewees with nothing else except just their dialogues. And you couldn't do that today. And it, it also sort of betrayed the fact that these filmmakers were supremely confident of the arguments they were making, which also meant that there was no space for ambiguity, no doubt, and of course, no space for personal reflection. You would never see them, you would never hear about them, classic voice of God narration, giving you a very, very well thought out argument, almost in a priori fashion. The argument is made, here's a film that extends the argument. Right? And everything goes towards that, the camera, the editing, and in fact, the editing all happened on the dialogue track. The images, the sound were all sort of you know, they were there, but not really crucial to the film itself. And so coming out of this then, even the 80s film society movements that a lot of people thought would push documentary into new directions somehow didn't, partly because these film society movements were interested in the avant-garde, they were interested in art cinema from around the world, and they thought these 70s documentaries and filmmakers were just heavy-handed. They were didactic, and the aesthetics were just not compelling enough for film society types. And at this time, also, let's keep in mind that fan clubs in South India were forging a very different sort of relationship to politics between cinema and politics. So all of this happening. And curiously enough, it's the opening up of the media sector, the entry of satellite television, cable and satellite television, that really, I, a lot of people would agree, sets in motion a new generation of filmmaking as well. And really late 80s, it's marked by a large number of women who enter this space with initiatives like Women Make Movies from the US, which was set up in 1972, making moves into Asia and Latin America. But also within India, the setting up of collectives like the Media Storm Collective in Delhi that Shohini Ghosh and a large number of other filmmakers were affiliated with. And crucially, the Drishti Media Collective in Ahmedabad that Shabnam Virmani and Stalin K set up and began pushing for a different kind of documentary, but also a different relationship with the subjects of the documentary and audiences across the country and including the diaspora and other parts of the world as well. And that's where something like Samina Mishra's film comes out as well, where you see a different kind of form emerging from these. These are intensely biographical at times. They're very, very reflective of their own position. And they're also marked by a shift in form. Like I said, the camera, the editing, the dialogues, the focus on, especially the focus on the ordinary as the space from which to understand a lot of broader political and social struggles. And films like Lakshmi and Me, for instance, that focuses on relationships between women and maidservants at home that begin emerging out of this moment. But even more interesting is this also spawns the entry of large media corporations into the arena of documentary filmmaking, which is unprecedented, I'd suppose, in many different ways. You have big corporations like NDTV setting up an established documentary channel, if not a channel, at least a dedicated space. Documentary 24-7 is what they call it. There is, of course, PSBT. Um, there are these large, now, conferences held by this organization called Doc Edge, which brings together funding agencies from across the world, almost a sort of venture capital sort of mode of documentary filmmaking, where you go, you have script writing workshops, and you pitch your ideas, and you get funding, and in that way, through distribution and circulation networks as well. But also, in, in all of this, Again, this intensely biographical sort of films are, are getting into new kinds of distribution circuits that may not have been available earlier. And one of the most interesting moves is PSBT, which is 
the Public Service Broadcasting Trust, which has very close ties with Doordarshan, the national broadcaster. And in fact, Doordarshan guarantees free airtime to all the films made under the PSBD banner. Is that right? Well, yeah, they have a contractual Con uh, obligation. That's uh, PSBD is funded by a corpus right. by Ford Foundation, and that's part of the whole deal. So it's right. like a tripartite. Right. And again, many other agencies, MacArthur is part of this, Rockefeller is part of this, all of this is happening. And PSPD is interesting also because it emerges out of the failure of Doordarshan to imagine itself as a public broadcasting network. The debate that began in 87 with the Rajiv Gandhi administration, the Prasar Bharati bill, Prasar meaning disseminate, Bharati, Bharat, India, it f successive governments tried and tried and tried and the idea of autonomy for public broadcasting never took off. But interestingly enough, out of those efforts, out of those struggles, PSBT emerges and lo and behold, a space for documentary filmmaking is created, which... You know, these are the paradoxes of the media environment I think we're we're going through now of commercial interests clashing with sometimes facilitating grassroots efforts, grassroots efforts again tapping into commercial networks for distribution and circulation and so on. But this is then the broad terrain in which we can begin to understand Samina Mishra's film and ask her a few questions. So I thought I'd kick it off by simply asking, could you tell us where you fit into the PSBT model? <laughs> <laughs> How did they approach yeah. you? How did they commission the film? Okay. We're yeah. supposed to. Yeah, we are going to take turns at the microphone. <laughs> okay. The thing about PSBT is, um, it is um, when it started, it was it was actually a wonderful, wonderful idea because there really was no organization that you could um, uh, that was commissioning documentary films. Doordarshan had for a short while uh, commissioned a few films, but that just completely dried up. The one thing that, I, before we get to PSBT, mm -hmm. the one thing that I would like to say is that in the 90s, I think a, a lot of very interesting films, which in a way I think um, opened many things out for my generation of filmmakers in terms of ideas and form, were, uh, came out of this whole initiative of um, television networks from the West um, who were looking for films out of India. And th these films were well funded. And um, uh, films like A Tale from Planet Kolkata, um, uh, Diamonds in a Sabzi, uh, uh, Diamonds in a Vegetable Market, um, uh, Reena Mohan's Kamla Bai, which is, uh, you know, these were films that for my generation of filmmakers opened up the whole idea of what it meant to watch documentary film. Um, the, the whole business of being present in the film, even if you're not present physically on camera, uh, how you engage with the subject that you are uh, interacting with, uh, there was a lot that, you know, we learned from that. And um, that funding sort of dried up, I don't know, by the time I started wanting to make films, uh, there was no money available from there. So PSBD actually became really um, the only source of funding that we could approach for an idea that you wanted. There was a lot of you know, work available which came out of the sort of NGO movement because um, th there was a kind of natural alliance between documentary filmmakers and the sort of development sector, which at that time were you know, NGOs. And it came out of uh, initially the whole sort of documenting what the state wasn't doing, uh, and then so documenting then what the NGO was doing, and came out of efforts like that. Um, but then, you know, that was the NGO's agenda. So if you had an idea that you wanted to make, and um, it didn't quite fit into an NGO's idea, where would you go? And so PSBT mm -hmm. became this um, space. PSBT's budgets are <laughs> very, very low. And so you really, uh, what drives the film is something else. And um, many people, especially in the first few rounds of PSBT's commissioning, have made films that they really wanted to um, for PSBT because they just at least paid for the cost of making the film. So how do I fit into the PSBT model is that I think I, I just, I wanted to make this film. Uh, I wanted to make a film. I, didn't, it, I, don't, I don't know if it was exactly this film, but I wanted to make a film set there. And they really, you know, I couldn't approach Ford Foundation because they were not going to fund individual filmmakers. I couldn't approach Doordarshan because they weren't funding documentaries. I couldn't approach NGOs because it didn't, I mean, what would you say would be the agenda of this film? You know, it was neither development, um, neither uh, sanitation, <laughs> neither <laughs> healthcare. 
So really, there wasn't anybody else to go to. So PSBT provided me with that uh, space. Um, but other than that, do I see myself only as a... I, I think that it's time because PSBT has had many commissioning cycles. And so I think that there's, it's time for uh, us, we certainly are, and I think for PSBT to, to look at the model and see where it's going. Um, so I hope that I'm not exactly a PSBT filmmaker. <laughs> no, that, that wasn't no, my implication. <laughs> but you did raise another interesting question, is which when you go to, say, different funding agencies and so on, you use the word, what is the agenda of this film? And this is one of the recurring tensions of where certain old school filmmakers, the critics have emerged about, you know, in defense of the political, so to speak. Yeah. And this is not ostensibly or explicitly political in the way that the 70s and 80s films were. And they're not either, they're not in the sense of, let's say an NGO film like, say, When Women Unite, which was about the uprising in Andhra Pradesh about state liquor, uh, state granting liquor part of the ration card, and there was this film made about it. It's not in that space as well. Yeah. So how do you then make, so where do you fit in into that trajectory where yeah. there's a long history of the documentary being tied to an explicit yeah. notion yeah. of politics, yeah. but this is somehow different. Yeah. How, what exactly okay. is that? Um, you know, when I was growing up in the 70s and, uh, you know, it was mandatory for all uh, theatres to have a films division newsreel before the actual feature presentation. Um, and so, of course, we were all bored. We were the bored children at the <laughs> whatever. And no one really watched them. Although I now I'm, I'm learning that even films division, um, it's not so simple. And there were all kinds of practices happening there, which we were just not privy to, but there are filmmakers like SNS Shastri whose work actually from within the films division system was trying to do some path-breaking work. Um, but at that time, uh, so for, for, for me too, as for most Indians, documentary was the films division newsreel. But there was also this program that used to come on Doordarshan called Zara Sochie, mm -hmm. which means um, Zara Sochie meaning think a little. <laughs> so it was this... The, this sort of attempt at building kind of citizenship and uh, bringing social change, but at a, you know, a, a, on a small scale. So it would be things like, you know, they would shoot um, with sort of everyday people, a middle class housewife cleaning her house and then taking the garbage and just dumping it over the balcony. And then it would end with, say, Zara Sochi. <laughs> um, so there were lots of little shorts like that. And I remember really enjoying <laughs> watching them. So perhaps, you know, the whole uh, business of storytelling and social change and some sort of, uh, there was a notion that documentary filmmaking, those things are connected. There has to be a story and then there has to be something that you're trying to change. Um, and I, I think that also the, the sort of, the, that it doesn't necessarily have to be this big canvas that, uh, you know, the small spaces, the domestic, all of those are, as important um, as a, as the big, you know, um, Narmada Valley or, um, you know, the coal mines or whatever. And I don't think that I see it as a hierarchy at all. I don't. Uh, I think that, you know, those films are important, are significant, and I'm glad that they're being made. But I think that for my generation of filmmakers, it sort of, uh, because we came in, um, you know, post the whole sort of NGO movement, uh, where a lot of like activist movements had kind of become solidified into NGOs. And, you know, uh, many things had happened. The Babri Masjid was demolished and uh, uh, Mani Beli came under the Narmada waters. Many things happened. And so we realized that it's not... Uh, you know, change doesn't come like that. I mean, I, and I, I, I'm not saying that we realize it in some sort of, you know, tangible way, but I think instinctively we were veering towards this direction that uh, it is not the documentary film's job to change the world uh, or the documentary filmmaker's job to change the world. But it is, I think, our role to try to get the audience to change the way we look at the world. And so that, I think, is what my generation of filmmakers are really, really trying to do, to look at our world. And those are many worlds, and we hope to be able to look at them, look at all of those diverse worlds in whatever way we can, and try to see how we, sh we can look at them. And even, even, even that is diverse and uh, plural. So I think that for my generation of filmmakers, 
that's what happened. That, you know, it was uh, uh, this, the need to look at a small canvas came out of that. And um, that we were very clear that uh, when you look like sometimes I think that m maybe, you know, uh, some critics of this film will say that it's, it's very domestic. But actually, I don't see that as being domestic at all. I think that it's important that we can... Uh, you know, use the feminist uh, sort of phrase, the personal is political and reverse it as well, you know. So I think that it's imp for us, and when I say for us, I mean, I, I speak from sort of, you know, conversations that I have with peers. And I think that it's important that uh, we look at things which are in our own lives, small things uh, that we encounter, and see how they are connected to the larger question of, you know, where we're heading, um, in both in India and globally. Yeah. I mean, I don't think anybody would even suggest that some the people political have, field I think. is absent yeah. from the film. Yeah. I mean, it comes through vividly in some of the things that your mother and your grandmother yeah. and all of them said. But you mentioned a peer community of where you're yeah. talking about yeah. this. So how does, what are some of the conversations you've had about this domestic, but also connecting it to urban space yeah. that uh, several people here m might have attended Paramita Bora's uh, film screening and talk last year, which also engaged with similar yeah, sorts of yeah, themes. Yeah, so yeah. what are some of these conversations like? And I promise I will <laughs> stop after this. Um, well, they're pretty much like this, but I suppose um, a little more about form, because I think that is really what the change is um, showing through in, about form. Because the big activist films, um, you know, like Aan Patwarin, I mean, these are important films, so I don't want to seem as if I think that that's imp unimportant. But, you know, for people like us who came later, um, that narrative, the grand narrative somehow um, has not been something that we've taken to. So I think it's, and, and we haven't also precisely for what I said that, you know, uh, we realize that that's really not making the difference. So I think that it's more a question of, you know, trying to find out, uh, to explore what you can do formally with it. I think that in a way, I mean, we have, there are similar concerns. Anand would have similar concerns to what my concerns are in terms of politics. But it's a question of how we approach those ideas. So the conversations are really, I think, um, about form in connection with many of the ideas that we are all sort of working with. So, for example, because we inhabit these urban spaces, a lot of the ideas that we want to work on come out of uh, those urban spaces. Uh, but then our conversations will be about, you know, how do we how do we kind of find a way to talk about these things um, by bringing in sort of the texture that, you know, an audience can also engage with. Yeah, find some kind of resonance that, res I mean, why does it interest me? And so why could it possibly interest a viewer? And I notice I had there. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for that marvelous film. Thank you. Uh, if I had one selfish criticism, it would be that I wish it was a lot longer. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> oh, great art. <laughs> thank uh, you. Uh, several years ago here at U of M, uh, not that long ago, uh, people were celebrating Newsweek cover on, uh, it wasn't on Berkeley or Harvard or Duke or anything, it was on the University of Michigan University uh, because it happens to have, we happen to have such a large Jewish and Muslim slash Arab student enrollment here. And uh, maybe it's only at a place like Michigan where uh, that type of uh, national magazine cover would merit uh, what they were trying to do in that cover story. Similarly, your film. Um, we don't see the little history. Um, you mentioned change several times regarding your, um, your documentary generation or era. And um, it just reminds me of something my mom and dad always told us kids. You, know, you don't write or do a film or anything because you want to say something. You do it because you have something to say. And that's why I really wish that I, I look forward to your next film. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I think that uh, one of the constraints that comes from PSBT's uh, alliance with Doordarshan is that we also have a time constraint. It has to fit into the television half hour. <laughs> so, yes. Um, I had the privilege to have been in Michigan uh, Stadium uh, in 1967. I graduated from the University of Michigan at the same time when um, Bakir Hussein was 
keep his honorary grade. Oh, I see. We go way back historically. <laughs> um, but I have a question about the sub theme. I, the primary theme is about home. The sub theme is about cultural identity. And so my question, based on the research you did and the filmmaking that you do, is it possible for a person to have more than one cultural identity, or does a person have to have only one? Can a person have a blended one? or does a person have to choose? And then the second part of the question is, is your cultural identity uh, something that you are allowed to choose yourself, or is it bestowed upon you by others? Those are two parts of my question. Okay, questions. yeah. Um, well, uh, no, I, I think that identity is uh, very much plural. I don't think that uh, it's a question uh, of simply choice, I think there is a it's a sort of fluid, dynamic, interactive thing. Um, more so, I suppose now in the times that we live in. Um, I see myself as a Muslim. I say I, publicly, I am a Muslim, but I am not a practicing Muslim. So uh, for many, that would mean uh, I am not a Muslim. Uh, but I I challenge that because I don't think that. Uh, uh, there is there is some stuff that is sort of bestowed upon you because you sort of are born with it. And then there is some stuff that is bestowed upon you because you are looked at in a certain way. And you cannot disengage with that. You may not look at yourself like that, but you are being looked at in a certain way. And so you have to engage with it. So I, I think that that's why um, I am. I am a Muslim, even though I do not practice. However, I'm not just a Muslim. And so I think that cultural identity is uh, definitely very plural. I mean, I, I am I, I am a certain kind of Muslim. Um, I come from the north. I'm, uh, you know, English is really my primary language. Uh, I come from a certain very privileged class. Um, I, I have, uh, 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 there's, I mean, you know, like this is my first trip to the United States, but a friend of mine asked me, you know, uh, how does it feel? And I said to her, so much of it feels familiar. It feels like I'm in a movie because I have, those are also, that's also part of my sort of cultural landscape. So, um, yeah, that's what I think. <laughs> yeah. When you say you're a Muslim but not a practicing Muslim, how do you define that being a Muslim? Is it just believing in one God and that Muhammad is his messenger, or is it more an ethnicity, identification with your parents? And I'm a little confused of how you say it. Not a practicing Muslim but a Muslim. What does that mean? Because I don't think that being a Muslim is necessarily about Islam. Um, the religion. I think that uh, uh, your religious idea, I it's what I have been brought up as. So, for example, for me, it's important to celebrate Eid because I have been brought up to do that. And that is an occasion for my family to get together. And um, I, that's something that's been part of my life. And I want to pass, I want to keep practicing it and I want to pass that on. It's connected to being Muslim. So, I am also Muslim. Um, so I don't, I, I think that, you know, for example, we, in India, I think uh, we have, f for my husband, for example, to say that he's Hindu uh, is something that uh, doesn't have to be given much thought because you're in the majority community. It's, uh, there are many things that are accepted. Is, you know, everybody sort of accepts that you are uh, Hindu. It doesn't matter whether you go to the temple or not. But if you're in the minority community and if you say you're Muslim, automatically the question will be, oh, so do you pray five times a day? <laughs> you would never, if somebody were to say, I'm Hindu, you wouldn't really ask, do you go to the temple? So I think that that's, it's important to realize that we look at minority communities and, and this happens with Muslims in India. I'm sure it happens with other communities in other parts of the world. Uh, it's all important to realize that we make that connection with the practice of the religion much more strongly when we're looking at the minority community in India. So, so that's why it's important for me to say I'm Muslim and I'm practicing because I think that there are many kinds of Muslims in India and we don't all have to say our prayers five times a day because, uh, you know, God forbid if there's a riot, the rioter is not going to ask me, do you say your <laughs> prayers five times a day before he wants to attack me? You know, he'll ask my name. <laughs> Um, I kind of noticed this because I am Hindu and I've lived in the U.S. for 44 years where lots of mixed marriages are taking place. In bringing up our own children, we had to think, what shall we do? How yeah. will we handle this? What happens to the children? In your movie, basically the two Hindu men 
went along with their wives and said, okay, we'll be Muslim. But My husband is not a Muslim. But children are Muslim. My son is not a Muslim. I thought you, they said that uh, the children were given a Muslim that name. We were. Pardon me? We were. My parents were talking about me. Okay. Yeah. But, but please go ahead. Uh, go ahead with your question, I'll answer. So my, my question is, see, the, here there is one side that is saying, okay, you do whatever you want. One, uh, that's, I think, your dad who said that my world is where she is. That's right. Now, that is, if in every marriage that happened, <laughs> that is okay. But generally, both people have an identity. They have their religious as well as their cultural and all those identities, and it's not that simple. So then, then what happens if if one side gives in? That's fine. But if one side doesn't give in, which mm. we see a lot of people don't give in, then what was this telling us? Okay. It only told me that Hindus always say, "Okay, okay, fine, that's fine," because we've been taught that the God is anyway. God is God. Who, whether you call him Allah or you call him uh, something else, God is God. Okay. So th it doesn't mean anything. But I have a lot of Muslim friends and Christian friends. Some of them are of that view, others are not at all of that view. Okay. Well, actually, I don't think it's simple ever. I don't think it was simple for my parents. I don't think that uh, my father has given up his identity. I think he's whole held on to whatever part of his identity was important to him. Mm -hmm. This was not important to him. That's, I think, the dif it is never simple. Uh, in the case of my, f my husband and myself, my husband has not given up his identity. So uh, I think what becomes, uh, what is striking in my parents' case is because it's the man and not the woman. Because if it were reversed, because we live in sort of patriarchal, uh, a, a patriarchal world, it is accepted that uh, you might have a mixed marriage, but the children will be whatever the um, father is, or sort of, you know, go along more in that direction. Whereas in this case, that's not what happened, and therefore it's much more striking, because uh, you feel... <coughs> What's going on here? You know, the person has completely given it, given it up. But I don't think he gave it up. The things that were important to my father are what he held on to and what he passed to us. It's the thing that wasn't important to him that he didn't. And that's a negotiation that was between my parents. And it's a personal negotiation which happens everywhere. And it is, you know, uh, you're right. In, in many, many mixed marriages here, perhaps, you know, the woman hasn't been able to do that. But that's an internal personal negotiation between um, the two parties concerned. Um, and, of course, my parents made this choice of bringing us, uh, bringing us up as Muslim. But, you know, uh, frankly, I don't think that I'm really the kind of Muslim that uh, my mother thought I would be. So that, again, is something that she has to negotiate and deal with just as I'm sure many mixed marriages here need to do. And as, um, as far as my sort of, um, my, my own um, uh, case is concerned, my son, uh, I'm not bringing him up as anything, ad you know, I don't want to say as anything because that's... <laughs> 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 but um, I, my husband and I, my, uh, we both don't really practice. Um, but uh, for me, my sense of being Muslim is stronger uh, than I suppose my husband's sense of uh, being Hindu for various complicated reasons that we just talked about. Um, but uh, we are very clear, we talked about this, we are very clear, um, we were clear when he was to be born that uh, he would carry his surname and so therefore we also wanted him to carry something of what he inherits from me and therefore his name, his first name is Imran. So, you know, you can look at it and say that my husband gave in but, you know, his surname is my husband's surname, so did I give in? Or you could look at it and say, oh, communal harmony, <laughs> which, again, you know, I, I wouldn't agree with, but you could. But, you know, I leave that open. I mean, I'm not going to be sort of uh, dictate to everybody how they should look at me. Your own conversation <laughs> of yourself, yeah. comes true that you are a Muslim. I am. You are not a Hindu Muslim. No, Muslim. not at all. Hindu. No. So that tells me something. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, certainly. Please but drop it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but absolutely. Catch, I think very well the messiness of what she's trying to sort of what say. I, yeah. It, yeah. What I'm trying Yeah, that it's not it's easy. Not easy. No. No, and I don't think that it shows in the film that it's easy.
and also that this is not necessarily the only choice i mean it works for me but i'm not at all saying that it would work for everyone you know i mean we come with different histories There's several hands raised there and then there and then Sarina. go ahead okay yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you that was a that was a excellent show really enjoyed it um one of the things that i noticed is that uh, the way it's sort of you constructed the narrative of identity is, is very much that a lot of external factors were uh, played a big part in yeah. the constructive ourselves in terms of identity like uh, urban you know the urban landscape had a lot to do with it also like interactions with bureaucracy the largest state had a lot to do with it and i was wondering um, how your own because uh, what i enjoyed about this film is that it was also very reflective on yourself as however you want to define yourself and how did the film the process of making the film uh, did it challenge your own notions of identity for yourself and yeah. your family and how how did the media of film and you know camera work and all that you know yeah have, yeah was, was that part of the process of <coughs> yeah. your own construction of identity yeah, I actually, I think, you know, when I stand here and I answer your question, it seems to me at least, I don't know to others, that I'm sorted. <laughs> I don't know if I had really articulated it in that kind of way for myself until the film was done. So really, it was a process. Of course, I knew, I, I mean, you know, I've always been asked, um, because I'm Samina Mishra, uh, so I've always been asked what and how and all of that. So it's something I had to think about. But uh, I do. Uh, so I knew I was Muslim, but and that you know that it was it was an important part of me. I knew that. Um, but that really, you know, how do I kind of resolve the fact that uh, I don't actually pray? I drink wine, <laughs> uh, and um, I don't have a big desire to do the Hajj or all of that. You know, how do I resolve the fact that I don't have all of these, and yet there is a. It's important to me that I am Muslim. And I think that the film, kind of working on it and, you know, just writing, rewriting. My friend Paro is the script consultant on it because I had like 20 drafts of the script and, you know, I needed somebody to read each time. So I think that it sort of clarified this for me, my position. And uh, there may not be many takers for it, but there are some. And for me, it works that I know now what it means to me, why it's imp what it is that I want to pass on to my son and why. And yes, it is a lot to do with what's happening uh, outside, you know, externally and globally. And it, it's very connected to that. Because I think coming from a sort of privileged background, uh, it really didn't matter. I mean, yeah, I used to say, yeah, I'm Muslim, but it didn't matter in any way until, you know, after the Barbie Masjid, things changed in, in the country. Question here and then we'll... Yeah. Uh, I'd like to congratulate you for dealing this subject. I think it's very timely because um, because of the globalization of our, our earth. Uh, I've been here over 50 years. And I, um, uh, like uh, identity, it's a, I'm a Sikh, my wife is a Christian. We've been married over 45 years. We've never discussed or had an argument over religion. We have two children. We gave them a religious education. We took them to the Jewish temple. We took them to the Muslim uh, celebration. We took them to the Hindu temple. We took them to the Sikh Gurdwara. Uh, we go to Gurdwara. We go to the church. We, we treat a universality of, I've even stopped using the word God, because who's seen God? I call it infinity. When we see infinity, we'll see God. And I mean, this is a personal identity type of a thing which doesn't really, uh, which is, a, I agree with you, a multiple, we can have multiple identities. I go to church and I greet them there. So we go to Gurdwara, she goes to say God. Well, we all do have multiple yeah. identities. The question of do we recognize them? Well, <laughs> it's, a, it's a personal, it's a, it's a, it comes out of your insight. Nobody can teach you. And it depends, it's the education that you get. And my daughter, she, 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 she says in every breath, she says, you gave me good education. She, she always says, she looks at the religion as an open religion for everyone. She loves everybody. I love everybody. 
And that, that's the identity I carry. I love everyone. You're a good Christian. You be a good Christian. You be a good Muslim. You be a good Sikh. It's great. Or, you know, just choose oh, to be no, whatever, yeah. or many, or, right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, right. yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be just that one simple thing. Right. We'll Samina, thank you. It's a beautiful film, even if it was dim, and I hope I can see it at the proper illumination. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll watch it again. Thank you. I was really interested, particularly in the question and answer period, um, to think back through the way that, um, one's identity, one's identification, both to self and to the outside community, is a relational thing. Yeah. That, it's both multiple, but it's also one that we constantly perform in and out of identities <coughs> through time. And um, there are some traces left, naming practices, uh, a, a record of who brought what to the last Eid party, maybe. Um, but. By, by and large, it's an, an ephemeral thing. One could walk into defense and not say I'm a Muslim, and no one would ask you if you're one. And, and in the film, this is all um, played against buildings. Those things which seem to promise permanence, yeah. seem to promise some kind of sedimentation, a, an immovable, per, you know, a kind of fixity. Um, and I, I wonder, I presume there was some intentionality there. Certainly, you talk about a home, maybe a half of bricks and mortar, and bricks and mortars may be much more than just a, a, a structure. I love the tension between the fluidity of identity and the kind of obdurate permanence of, of, the, of the building itself. And I wonder if you would just talk about that Look. as a thematic. Yeah. As a thematic yeah. Um, of course, you put it much better than I uh, had imagined it, I think. when, But, you know, it really, I think, comes from why I wanted to make the film there. This is Okla. And um, all this, most of all the, the, the new migrants that come in from the North Indian Khasba towns or smaller towns in UP and Bihar, uh, Muslim migrants, they gravitate here. And they gravitate here because this is now recognized for the, uh, you know, the university is one reason because um, many of them come to study. But even those that come for job and livelihood, they gravitate here because it's seen as a Muslim area and therefore um, uh, safer. Uh, it's also because they are refused housing elsewhere. And so they gravitate here. So the space is getting, uh, you know, it's. It's quite sort of it's, it's because of the river and because there is a colony called Friends Colony, which we talk about. And so it's sort of there's a kind of boundary, a natural boundary that exists there. So where are all these people to go? They're going vertical. Um, and uh, this so it's sort of full of narrow gullies with, you know, apartment buildings with all kinds of names from Riverview apartment to, you know, uh, Al something apartment. You'll get them all. So uh, somewhere I think instinctively uh, uh, th there was a con there, that, that, that's the most sort of I think visible connection that the playing out of identity in this very brick and mortar form, uh, the choice of location and wanting to own a piece of real estate there because you feel safe or because you cannot own it anywhere else. So uh, somewhere I think instinctively I sort of gravitated towards the space also because of that. Um, and then there's a question of, um, for example, my family and, uh, you know, uh, having the idea of home, really, that if because we have that space and we can, it can become like a focus of what it means to belong. Uh, so we're lucky. But for those who don't, who need to migrate, who need to move and yet... Um, want to create that focus, how do you do that, you know? Uh, and I think that in, in this area, people are doing it by <coughs> building. So uh, I think that's where some I, I wanted to... Actually, I think that it's not so clear in the film. That's one of the things that I don't think I fully kind of comprehended, I think, while I was doing it. But that's one of the things that's... Uh, um, that this space kind of represents for me, you know, the need to kind of find some tangible space to say, okay, I belong. But actually, maybe you don't, you know, you've come in from somewhere else and you're living with some kind of sense of insecurity as well. Um, 
and and someone like me it's easy to say yeah okay i can say oh my, for my mother you know that because we have that house you know we we just inherited it one had a question yeah. well you know in in uh, in greek literary theory there's the big difference between the tragedy and the comedy which in english no longer we we can use these words in the greek way because they have taken on other connotations but in the tragedy, things fall apart. <laughs> and in the comedy, they come, come together. together. In that sense, you, your film is a comedy. <laughs> and it is Thank a, you. It's a national comedy. <laughs> because it's about, it's about how India could come together. Right? And it struck me that the villains of the piece that are sometimes identified and sometimes just implied are the Muslim League on the one hand mm. and the BJP on the other. Both are denounced mm. in some way. Yeah. And it's a very Congress film, I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to say it's a <laughs> <denial. laughs> But it is. Uh, and, uh, and one of the things I was struck by uh, uh, was uh, when we were given the tour uh, by that remarkable man who kept telling us, Al Al, mm. uh, he pointed to the Punjabi alias. Is the implication that not only have Muslims found <laughs> refuge in this neighborhood, but those were Lahori Hindus. Yeah. 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 So uh, that, it struck me that, again, that's a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. Yes, it is actually. The reason that he's in the film is precisely for that. Because this area uh, in Delhi is, you know, it's mini Pakistan. B so it was very important for me to have someone like him who could have moved out but he fe and and this is you know you see just in the scene after that they're saying the friday namaz uh, on the road so you know it can't get uh, more non-hindu than that but he doesn't feel discomfort so you know the notion of uh, belonging uh, is a complicated one and it doesn't necessarily have to stem from this ki a kind of mono religious identity it comes from many things and that's why he's in the film to find yeah. their home yeah. in yeah. Delhi. So that's why he's it's messy. <laughs> we have time for a few more questions, but I'm not completely persuaded by the BJP yeah. Muslim League either. I, I'm, yeah, the, the, uh, the moments was, you know, the <laughs> loans and credit cards, for example. That's yeah, a that's... Sort of way in which yeah, I think... Again, sort of in asserted in a way that even the buildings sometimes aren't able to, right? Yeah, I hope that there are more villains in it <laughs> than the <laughs> BJP and the Kong. <laughs> the Muslim League. <laughs> That's really uh, a bit much press. A uh, couple more questions maybe. Just following up on what I thought it was really wonderful and I love the way you play with the permanency and impermanence of the building. Oh, I thought that was just brilliant. And the conceit of calling the movie House on Gulmohar Avenue when in a way, a lot of the film is actually about traveling <coughs> to and coming back. Yeah. Visually, you see a lot of you know trucks and uh, rickshaws and scooters going back and forth. And I think it kind of follows up on Will's question about the way in which uh, the building works for you. You know that it's important, but it's not fixed. So that's why you also have the laborer for whom it is just you know uh, brick and mortar. But I think it addresses Juan's point because. I would think the congressy would be that you transcend the identity. But what I like about the film is that you don't transcend. No, I you live the messiness of yeah, the world. So yeah. this is not the transcendence of you know Muslim to Indian, mm -hmm. but it is Muslim, and that is it. Yes. Which is so beautiful about it. Thank you. Th no, that's what I want that, uh, you know, uh, when I said, you know, maybe some people are going to look at Imran as a poster boy for communal harmony. <laughs> that's it. I, uh, you know, that would be the transcendence. <laughs> but it's not, you know, that that is not real. <laughs> It's Another messy. Another film that does this brilliantly is My Mother India, yeah. where yeah. forget brick yeah. and mortar, they use film fair images to sort of narrate this really complicated and messy history. So one more question. If not, I'm sh be happy to answer more over refreshments. Yeah. All right. Well, please join me in thanking Senator Thank you. Thank you all for coming.